think uh, Crunch, or, or you're, you're, wait a minute, you're JD Crunch man now. You had a story from those early days. Uh, so um, why don't you take the mic and tell us? And you can stand up so people can see you. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the phone board, call computer, and go to I was uh, basically uh, developing. Uh, I was uh, working on an electronic uh, circuit, and I needed a computer to help me solve Chevy Chevy Butterworth circuit design and filter designs. The formulas were overly complicated, and I was told by a guy by the name of Cal about call computer. I go to call computer, and I learned that I could get online for just 99 cents an hour, and for the first week, I had a free account. Well, I wrote a, a few little programs, uh, one of them just to get used to basic programming, because I've never programmed before. And I wrote this little program to compute the, uh, the even tempered scale of music, the musical scale, just to understand how to use it. And then I started uh, working on other things, and now after a while, I, I got this really complicated program, and it was kind of like spice. You put in a circuit, and it would solve the circuit with, you know, multiply uh, arrays using uh, array processing and things. And uh, it, uh, I left a printout on the floor by mistake. Alex Cameron called me up and chastised me for leaving a mess in the computer room. And he, then he said, what is this? And I explained it to him, and now he hired me as a programmer. He put me in charge of the public library. And so we had some students at Mountain View High School, and uh, Randy here and, uh, and Chris were part of the uh, development program. They called it the Apple Develop, not, not the Apple Developers, but the uh, Call Computer Developers. And they had high school kids come in, and I teach them how to use the computer. And uh, they set up the B900 accounts. B915 was Mountain View High School. Mine was B907. And there was a bunch of other B accounts. And I always kind of maintain all that stuff. And I built a, a cross assembler. I did a 6800. Uh, Randy here did a 6502. And uh, I think I did an F8 and an 8080. And this was just during the time I learned all these little machine languages, all these little processors. They were writing little cross assemblers for it. And then later on, I did the phone board for Apple. Now, this was like in 76, right? And I can remember back in the days, uh, 77, yeah. Uh, back in the days when uh, Waz would have a, it was kind of in a little annex. It was kind of away from the main part. There was like a main building, and then there was a little, little building off to the side, a uh, little Apple lab building, and that's where Waz and Randy were there working on it. I think Randy kind of worked on a little printer, printer thing with a little 40 call printer. And uh, they'd go to Bob's Big Boy and they'd print out these little things for your convenience. Little Alpha Seltzer tablets on the menus of Bob's Big Boy. And then uh, my phone board, when I got the phone board working, I, uh, I did the, uh, um, I did a little test program, like a little, I think it was an answering service, a little, little call, you could enter in the number and uh, make the calls and it would dial the number. The phone board was really amazing. I had originally designed it with nine chips, uh, using an uh, 8-bit A to D, A to D, and A, D, C, and then Steve here designed it with a four, uh, six bit DAT because it was less expensive. It just meant that it had to write more code. Oh, big deal. So it was much cheaper. So we got it down to five chips. And then, uh, and then we started playing around with it, and I realized that in order to hook things up to the telephone, you had to go through a special interface device. So that the telephone company, this was the reason why we couldn't actually market it. Because in order to interface it to the telephone line, you couldn't actually legally connect to the telephone without going through special kind of equipment. It was one reason. And the other reason is that the phone board could have evil thoughts. It could be used for naughty tones. At the time, the phone company still was using the old ancient in-band signaling, which of course caused all kinds of problems with toll fraud and other things like that. And so uh, after a while, I gave Waz the, uh, the cassette tape with a, little, with a little basic program on it that he could try out. I go home and he reprogrammed it to call Jaws and Tap over and over again. <laughs> 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 and, so, and so I come back to Apple the next day and then, and then I, and I just get chastised. I couldn't figure out why it was, what happened. And he was like really, really mad, pissed off at me. Anyway, so that's kind of the story that happened around, around thing I can remember also, Mike Scott. Uh, would, uh, would smoke in the lab, and I would kick him out, and I'd get a little, a little apple over there. Here you go. <laughs> Actually, Mike Scott didn't smoke, he just pretended to get you out of his place. So that phone board was actually kind of incredible because, John, I'm so proud. 
He used one phase lock loop to not only generate touch tones, but to sense the tone that it was listening yeah, to. It was so you could way. tell if you got, if you dialed in 1978 or 77, you could tell if you dialed and got a ring tone or a busy or whatever. And modems weren't going to do that for another 12 years. To say, you know, modems would just have to dial and wait for, you know, 30 seconds thinking it might be going through because they couldn't sense the tones and tell. Remember in 78, Gassy brought me back to Apple to make about 10 more of those boards? Oh, well, we did. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Waz. Stories. Stories to relate under two minutes. Apple in 76. Anybody else here? Two. Thank Steve for giving us the Apple because we took it into many, many, many schools. We took other computers into schools as well. And we had a storefront computer center and people came and for $10 a month they could get all the unsold time. I think it was $2.50 an hour if you actually bought prime time. $10 a month you could be a member and you could stay there all night. Um, but when was first uh, brought the Apple One up to Katati, California, which is where we were at our storefront, the Root Center. Uh, it was in a box, and I think it was in actually an old Apple packing crate, wasn't it? Set Apple, set Apple on the outside, it was a wooden box. And I remember he said, well, we're, we're gonna give you one of these. And I knew nothing about computers. I was interested in education and learning. Computers just seemed like a neat toy. Um, so, it was great, we're gonna get this wonderful computer, but then when we got it, it was just this bare printed circuit board. I had no idea what to do with it at all. So, um... I would have helped, but the party was a long ways away. Yeah, it was a, it was a, two, it was a three hour drive. Um, but then that's where we needed computers because they weren't gonna get there from Sunnyvale and the other one. Um, so one of our friends, Glenn West Worstel, who was um, at HP, actually in Santa Rosa, built the blue case that's down there, and built a power supply for it. And then I still didn't have a keyboard, and I had to call Waz up and say, well, how do we get anything in or out of this thing? He said, oh, well, you know, buy a keyboard. I said, what kind of a keyboard? Well, you know, you could get a, get a, a Cherry Pro keyboard, that would do it. So I had to drive all the way down to, to Palo Alto from Katani because there was no, nothing in Sonoma County where you could buy anything without a computer. So it has a long history, and then of course, I kept calling him up because we took, we take it into a classroom. We had a 40 minute class. It took 20 minutes to load basic off the uh, cassette. And if it didn't load right the first time, if you didn't have a cheap enough tape recorder, and you didn't have the, <laughs> the volume set exactly right on the tape recorder, it wouldn't load. So then it would be another 20 minutes to load it, and that was the end of the program. <laughs> that was the end of the class. So there were many math classes at Windsor Junior High School that didn't get to actually program. They got to learn that computers had uh, variable reliability. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, one, basic was on cassette tape, so it took a, uh, a long time to load basic in, whereas in the Apple II, we were the first company to use the brand new 2K ROMs, four of them, adding up to 8K bytes in the Apple II. We're the, just the first. AMI was supposed to be the first company to come out with them. Theirs didn't come out correctly. We went over to Cinertech, and Cinertech's good. So we used these Cinertech's ROMs, and you turn on the machine, beep. How nice to have basic running at your command, that, you know, in one-tenth of a second. Less than that, actually. So, so during that time, when that transition was happening, I was calling Steve every couple of weeks saying, what do I do with this thing? I can't use it. You want me to use it in schools? I want to use it in schools. We can't use it. So there was this, this dialogue going back and forth that I finally sent the Apple one back to him and said, send me something that I can really use in, in, in a complete idiot's environment. So we did. Good. Okay. Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, name, serial rank, and serial number. My name is David Yardrum. Uh, I guess I would be guilty of introducing Liza to you. Um, I don't know if I have a story as much as a question. And that is, I didn't have any relationship at all with Apple computers in my life history. Uh, I did work at the time you were doing the homebrew show. The first one I was working for a company called ProData whose president was Seymour Rubenstein, uh, and I, so I'm guilty of some of the design of work stuff. Okay. 
mayor Colton. But, and the only other piece of my interaction is that I went to Atari uh, and said goodbye to Steve Jobs the day he left to go to Apple. But I happen to have been sitting next to you on a couple of those occasions when you were entering um, BASIC at the keyboard of your Flywood box machine. And it struck me from looking over your shoulder that you actually did have the ability to backspace and cancel out if you did, not that you made a lot of errors, but did, didn't you have that ability in that loader? For the Apple One, backspace and Apple I can't remember. Yeah. I, I'm sure I would have put it in. Yeah, yeah why would I not? <laughs> of course, that's, the whole, that's one of the advantages of being able to type in a line, yeah. So, I only had two, by the way, I only had 256 bytes of program to read in your commands to the Apple One, which were to store data in memory, to examine a block of memory or run a program at a certain address. Just the things that a front panel would do. And that was 256 bytes. It took two chips, two prong chips, and we had an HP for developing calculator stuff. That's how few transistors were on typical chips back then. Yeah. So I actually did a question. So, so, so of course I might not have backspace because there's a limited amount of time you can write something, but I'm sure I did. Underscore. So if I could finish the, there's a small dialogue in there. Um, so the other question that, oh, yeah, yeah. Right. That, right. that when you announced the product, uh, in, from what you're saying today, it's much clearer because you explained that you had the video done prior, which isn't something you didn't mention at the homebrew meeting when you announced the product. Uh, you described how you had used um, address fetch timing to load uh, four, no, three forty. Uh, well, 128 bytes uh, in three segments, or pardon me, twice that perhaps, and then you were using 120 of the 128 available bytes that you loaded because the timing synchronized between the DRAM refresh and the video display refresh. The, you did the vertical blank processing in the same clock interval that you did the DRAM refresh, and so you're relying on that to do the load. And I, at the time, was working, as I say, for a company that ran Vortex, the operating system, and had lived with people throwing away eight bytes out of uh, 128 a lot, and asked you what it would take to be able to recover those eight bytes. And you said about $1.30. And <laughs> that's why it didn't happen. I think I said something like I should have bought stock, and instead I said, Programmers might curse your name about having to recover that, but that's a, that's all ancient history. Uh, we have Salam and Formsy. We're now going over enough time that we probably only have time for a couple of questions. Be we only have time for a couple of questions because we've got a cake to cut and the pictures to take and whatnot. So sorry about that. We're kind of we're kind of crunched. Who's who's jumping up and down in the back here? Come up. We'll come right up for the mic. And state your name, rank, serial number. Uh, John Gilbert, uh, programmer. Um, I've been going over the WAS monitor and some of the, the code. Uh, one thing is a, just a request to put uh, out in the public a, a copy of the basic source code. Uh, you know, everyone can disassemble it, but uh, supposedly that was handwritten on paper. And it'd be really great to be able to see your notes and, and kind of correlate that to the code. Uh, the other thing was, uh, could you just kind of go over a, a timeline as to how you rocked the 6502? You know, you, obviously you didn't, uh, was, was that the first assembly coding that you were doing? Did you write the monitor before anything else? How, yeah, how did that come along? Thank you. Okay. What was the first question? First question is, could you open, could you release a copy? Could you release a copy? Yeah, I've got my handwritten notes of the basic, and I have plans for those. Um, I, yeah, as I mentioned, I plan to bring them here to the, to the I, I have to get time to kind of document what it is. I mean, I've got the notebooks. I actually say a really strange thing. I thought that I was on something big, that the Homebrew Computer Club made me feel like this was a revolution. So every single piece of paper that I ever scratched the least bit of thing on went all in chronological order, but no dates on them, into folders, 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 you know, a, a huge long thing. I never threw one sheet of paper out through the entire design process. So I still got that kind of stuff. 
it, it, it'll show up someday. I mean, it really belongs almost in the digit barn more than any other place. But um, and the second question was, uh, what, how did you learn 6502? How did I learn 6502? Yeah, I had been into computers my, my whole life. I would sit down with many computers back in the late 60s when all the companies, uh, Data General, Varian, Hewlett Packard, um, Digital Equipment, had many computers, and I would design my own versions of them in hardware, but I would sit down and try to see how would I start to write assembly language code, even to maybe write something like a Fortran compiler, or at least start reading data. So I would start writing code, but I could never type it into anything. Never had tested assembly language anywhere except, yeah, in college. I programmed an assembly language on the, um, the CD6600 at Berkeley, beautiful risk machine language that I love. I took tons of courses in assembly language at um, De Anza. A friend of mine even had a, a key to the computer room where we'd go in at midnight and work uh, through the night. They didn't know we were there. And just run programs. I just love running programs. So I've been around assembly languages as well as scientific languages. So oddly enough, I've never programmed in basic in my life. Why would I decide to write a basic instead of a Fortran? I could just tell that there were books out there like 101 basic games, and this was the sort of flavor you had to have for the new uh, interest in computers. Small computers, small low cost computers for people. What, was the monitor the first? Oh, yeah. yeah okay. So, so was the monitor, it wasn't the first assembly language program I wrote because I had had courses that did in colleges that used assembly languages of big mainframes. For a small computer, like a mini computer or an 8 bit computer, of course it was the first. Um, was it, yeah, it was the first, first assembly language. Yeah, it was the first time I'd ever used that sort of assembly language ever. Um, wrote it, I programmed it into a couple of ROMs, brought them to my workbench one night. The first set using interrupts on the keyboard didn't work. I couldn't detect exactly why, but then I moved on to the poll routine and it actually worked and it shocked me. And uh, I, had, I had a 256 byte program done and completed working and now it was time to move on to a 4K basic. And I want to say, uh, Waz, uh, Digibarn would love, would love to scan all those in for you. <laughs> um, anyway, I want to let you know that uh, last year, uh, we actually found a copy of the so-called Waz Wonder Book uh, a couple of years ago and uh, was able to present that. That's how a lot of the notes from Waz's filing cabinet in the summer of 77, this is the Apple II. And we dutifully scanned it in, a guy in New Mexico hand hand touched up some of the drawings. It was a old photocopy of this, these notes and we put it up under the digibarn.com and uh, gave a copy back to Waz uh, uh, the homebrew uh, event. And so that's kind of a, it, and people really value seeing those notes. So we'd love to, to, to do that again for the notes you already have. Sure. And uh, we're kind of, we have to wrap it up. I've been told by the big cheese and so we're going to have uh, a great uh, birthday cake cutting here. And we're going to move, and Islam's going to make some notes while I move stuff out of the way and get the cake moved over here. If you want to take pictures of the cake cutting, please maintain a respectful distance a little bit back there. Because uh, we're going to have the cake right here. And then the guys will do the cutting, and then we'll serve cake uh, to, uh, to anybody who wants it. If you really want the sugar high, uh, it's available to you. And with that, uh, from my part of the program uh, is, is over apart from the cake cutting and really thank you all for, for being here. And uh, if Waz is feeling well enough, he may sit at the red table there and continue to sign things. If he's not feeling well, it's free to go home at this point. But um, anyway, thank you uh, very much and I'm gonna pass it over to Salam.
And so the way uh, it's interesting because it, um, that the, the whole uh, uh, you know I grew up on the Apple II, and it's kind of interesting that these guys sort of have come around in a way in full circle because my passion that led me to do this event was begun by these guys and what they built and, and the passion that instilled in me uh, to basically get into computers and, uh, and continue on and, and you know, make a career out of it. So it's definitely exciting for me. Um, so anyway, I have, in, in honor of uh, Waz's uh, um, love of, of games and things, I've come up with a kind of novel way for uh, giving away this uh, replica one, which we're going to do right now. And uh, it's kind of experimental. I hope it works. So let's, uh, let me try to first uh, boot up the computer, uh, which is always on. And uh, Chris, is, uh, what, what's kind of the history behind this and then that led into the uh, reference manual? Well, the first documentation for the Apple II was a set of, of programmer's notes that people assembled and that were taken down to um, an instant printer on a regular basis. Um, and done in batches of uh, 50 or 100 like that uh, in report covers. And uh, every week there'd be a different set of stuff. So you know, if you got a, a, a mini manual, that was what it was called, um, yours was probably unlike any other mini manual you could find because every production run had a different set of content according to what had been written and what had been found. At, at some point, um, Mike Scott got a little disgusted that we didn't have a a real manual looking like manual, so he took the contents of the mini manual and whatever information he could find. There's a, a complete listing of the ROM in here. Um, there's uh, some things that I typed up on an IBM Selectric typewriter in my bedroom and hand illustrated. There's some things written by Dana Reddington. There's things written by Waz. There's a bunch of output from a uh, that 40 column electrostatic printer uh, in the shiny silver paper with it burned through and you could smell it when it printed. Um, and uh, he had Sherry Livingston type up everything else and took it down to the instant printer, put it all together in an order that, that seemed reasonable and uh, pasted it with paste, page numbers onto the bottom, and had it printed up. Um, this is the Apple II reference manual, January 1978, and there, uh, there was never really another like this. When I went off to college in, uh, in September of 78, Jeff Raskin gave me a copy of this saying, um, I know you're going off to college. I think you might want a part-time job to have some spending money. So why don't you write a real reference manual? And that was about the degree of instruction he gave me. So I went up to Berkeley. I got an account on Unix A that Apple, Apple paid for. He uh, raised my salary to $5 an hour. Um, and, uh, and that actually paid my way through college, believe it or not. And by the next June, I had produced in on the Unix system uh, in VI using T-ROF. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 um, Apple took the final draft of the Apple II reference manual, except I was the big problem. And this is where I nearly got uh, Andy Hirschfeld kicked out of the school. Um, the big problem was that the book wasn't done, but school was. And I had just finished my finals and needed to pull a couple of all-nighters to do the final proofs, but it took too long to wait for the photo typesetter to print out 200 pages. Andy was a grad student, and he had access to the VAX, the 11780 on the fifth floor of Evans, which underclassmen did not have access to. And attached to the VAX was the uh, Versatec 36-inch plat platen printer plotter, the Waterloo driver for t -Rob. And I was able to do four pages up of proofs fast as uh, the machine could spool them out instead of waiting two days for 200 pages of photo typesetting to come out. And so I was up there uh, previewing and proofing the manuals in the graduate student area. And here I was a freshman. Um, you know. 11 at night, 12 at night, 1 in the morning, 2 in the morning. Well, you know how that turns into 7 in the morning. And when the graduate student advisors came in and saw this freshman using their 36-inch printer, uh, printer and their uh, precious Vax 11780, which had, what, that had 16K of memory in it, I guess. Uh, they uh, asked, 
questions and uh, nearly got me an Andy kicked out of school. But um, I, I got the manual done, took it down to Apple, and they bound it, and that's what's there. So we, so we need to uh, turn on the projector to do my silly giveaway uh, contest here, so we don't want to blind you guys. All right. So uh, this is a puzzle, and the way it's going to work is whoever the part of the, world, the, the part of the puzzle is to figure out what, how to figure out the puzzle. If that makes any sense. So basically, the first person uh, who thinks they have the answer just go ahead and blurt it out. So we will try to identify you uh, orally. And uh, here we go. Okay, here we go. So, as soon as you have the answer, blurt it out, and whoever blurts out the correct answer first wins the replica one, courtesy of Vince Burrell, Real Computer. Okay, here we go. 42. Keep on the first? Yeah. There he goes. Yeah. The answer is Steve Wozniak. What, what this is, this is an anagram of Steve Wozniak. Now, Steve Wozniak, whenever you uh, email Woz, uh, he has an anagram of his name uh, as his signature. And so I found this uh, handy thing called, I, well, I always try to come up with a really clever one that maybe Steve hadn't heard of before that maybe he might uh, admire, but I cheated and used the uh, internet anagram server to come up with these. So I'll just show you the other ones that I came up with are kind of cute. So here's the <laughs> And uh, here's one. That one's pretty, that one I actually came up with on my own uh, a long time ago, but I never had a chance to email Watson to see if he was impressed with it. <laughs> and, here's another one. and then, of course, this is what uh, you get if you ever, if uh, Watson uh, responds to your inquiry. So. More okay at new size teeth. Or we're okay, new size TV, correct. So anyway, so that's our silly giveaway, and I'm glad that uh, somebody who will really appreciate it uh, got it, Ken, Ken Summerall. Very good. And uh, cake time. Cake time. I guess we'll move the cake into the uh, floor over here, and uh, we'll do cutting, and we'll ask our, our panel uh, to participate in that and uh, take the first bites. And then um, what do you guys think as far as... Uh, you know, we have a big line of uh, folks here who would look pretty enthusiastic, I guess. Um, you guys could be out for a little while. Okay, good. And um, I guess uh, that's it. Everybody's welcome to, to uh, enjoy some cake. We'll try to make as many pieces as possible. And this has been a wonderful event. And we've still got a lot more to go. It's only 3 o'clock. We have the exhibit hall over 3 o'clock. I'm sorry, until 6 o'clock. We need to have the...